Any other prophet? You find a quotation in the New Testament from the Old Testament, it's very likely to be Isaiah, known as the prophet of redemption. Almost all of chapter 53 is quoted somewhere in the New Testament. And it was written about 700 years before the birth of Christ. It's, um, while you're finding it there, I'll just mention this. It's what the Ethiopian was reading when, when Philip came upon him. Isaiah, uh, yeah, chapter 53 you might remember Philip, one of the first, one of the deacons in the church there in Jerusalem, uh, was uh, going along, and he saw a man in his car, no, in his chariot, uh, and he was reading Isaiah. And uh, he went near, and, and he asked him, "Do you understand what you're reading?" That's a good question to ask somebody when they're reading the Bible. And he said, "How can I? <laughs> if someone, except someone that should guide me." And so. Uh, it tells that he's reading Isaiah 53. It quotes some of it. And uh, the man says, who is this talking about? Himself or some other person, some other man? And here's what, the, what Philip said. He said, he opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. He explained to him that Isaiah 53 is all about Jesus. And you know, the, uh, Israel has had a real struggle with Isaiah 53. Uh, they've tried to say, oh, that's about Israel, but it's obviously not about Israel. Uh, Isaiah 53 is about Jesus. But you know, uh, Israel, like everyone else, struggles with Isaiah 53 because it shows we need a Savior. <clears throat> and we don't, we don't always like that idea <clears throat> that we need someone else to rescue us, but we do. And uh, we're going to do something a little different this morning. Uh, we're, I'm going to read the whole chapter and a, a little bit more. And I'm going to ask you to join with me and read verse 6. All right? When I get to verse 6, I want you to read with me. And I want, let's, let's stand up together. I don't often do this. But I'm going to start in Isaiah 52, verse 13. And then we're going to read right through Isaiah 53. And when I, when I get to verse 6, you read with me. Just that one verse, all right? Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, for he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Thank you. You may, you may be seated. 
Isaiah. Isaiah 53, a very well-known chapter. Many people have, have memorized it. Uh, we sang uh, many of the words uh, this morning. In verse 1, shows us Israel's unbelief. You know, he says there, who hath believed our report? What he's saying is, uh, people have not been accepting the message of God. You know, Isaiah would come, Jeremiah would come, Elijah would come, and, and they would preach the message of God. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Uh, they wouldn't believe the power of God. You know, you talk to people about what God can do, and, and you know, most people, it's, it's like, they just won't believe. Back in uh, chapter 52, verse 10, he talks about his, his strength, the arm of the Lord. He says, The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Listen, people can deny God's strength and God's message now, but someday they'll have to understand the, the truth of it. Uh, the Bible tells us that someday uh, people will, will know the truth. And he, he begins to talk about Jesus, and we see... One of the things we see is, is the virgin birth. Uh, he says there in verse 2, He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a di dry ground. You know anything about Bible history? Uh, God was tending the plant of Jesus' birth. <laughs> uh, you know, he, he first he raises up Israel. Uh, that's a miracle in itself. Forms them in Egypt, of all places. Uh, he raises up the tribe of Judah. He raises up King David. You know, all of these, God said, he'll come through Israel. He'll come through Judah. He'll come through David. And, uh, you know, all, all this time, Satan is opposing. God is tending. God is tending his, his tender plant. Uh, in Mary, you have the line of David through Nathan. Uh, he's a physical heir, as God had said, of, of David. In Joseph, you have the line of David through Solomon. He's the legal heir of David. You know, God has, has made that happen. And God has protected uh, his, his heritage in bringing Jesus through the virgin birth. He uses a term there in verse 2, as a root out of a dry ground. Now, I don't know if you will know what this is, and if it's the same expression we use here in Australia, but uh, do you know what a sucker plant is? A sucker plant is when you have a, a plant that you want to get some fruit from or a product from, and out of the base or even out of the ground will come a plant that, if you leave it there, will not help the, the productivity of, of your plant. I, I looked it up, and uh, one of the ways it described it was the, the undesirable part of the plant that should be removed to prevent it from sucking away the plant's energy. <laughs> well, that's how people viewed Jesus. We don't need him. Cut him off. Uh, I remember as a kid, my dad would have me go through the garden and, and cut off the suckers. Or I don't know if I always did the right, the right one, but, <laughs> you know, dumb kids are. But, you know, I went through cutting off things. And uh, that's the way people view Jesus, like a root out of a dry ground. They say, that's, we don't need that. Cut him off. And yet, he was the one that, that God had sent. He, he's the plant that, that God was, was tending. You know, people didn't want him. And uh, it, over and over, he uses expressions uh, about that in Isaiah 53. The other thing you notice in verse 2 there is it says, He hath no form nor comeliness when we shall see him. There's no beauty that we should desire him. You know, the idea of Jesus has been kind of romanticized over the years, hasn't it? If they make a movie about Jesus, quite often, you know, he, he walks by and everybody goes, ooh, you know, and he glows or something. Listen, Jesus could walk through a crowd and you wouldn't know he was there. There wasn't anything unusual about the way he looked. There wasn't any particular beauty uh, about him, probably the beauty of the day was not his, the way he looked. It, it's funny, different cultures, different things are beautiful. I won't, I won't go into that. Uh, Hawaii comes to mind, and you know, 700 pound women being the, the, the standard of beauty, but uh, I, I won't talk about that. Uh, uh, Jesus had no fancy birthplace, he had no fancy birth. Uh, in fact, people thought he came from Nazareth and said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? You know, they had no respect for uh, where he came from physically. He had no unusual physical uh, features. You know, the Bible says the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That was the key. Uh, God's, God said he's, uh, he's, he's revealed himself. He's the God manifest in the flesh. And that's what Isaiah is talking about here. 
But we not only see his virgin birth, we see his vicarious suffering. I use that word vicarious. Uh, that word means experienced by one person that benefits another. It's when you do something that benefits someone else. Well, Jesus did something that benefited us. And uh, he, the Bible calls him here a man of sorrows. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now, it's not that he was an unhappy man in himself. I think Jesus must have been a, a cheerful person because children were attracted to him. Now, I, I don't think uh, they would have been attracted to him if he was morose and unhappy. But he bore our sorrows, the Bible says. Uh, verse 4, he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He's a man of sorrows. Uh, one of the things I noticed as I went through Isaiah 53 are, are the pronouns. Now, do you remember pronouns? Uh, he, him, I, you, we, that, that kind of thing. Um, it, it's very personal. And, and you see, he is despised. He is rejected. We hid our faces. We esteemed him not. He hath borne our griefs. We did esteem him stricken. He was wounded. He was bruised for our iniquities. You see how personal it is? See, this wasn't something that God just said, oh, I think something needs to be done. God says, I'm going to go and do something. I'm going to go and bear their sins. I'll be the sacrifice for sins. That was God's, God's purpose and God's intention. You know, many people of his day uh, would not associate with him. He was despised and rejected of men. Uh, many would not recognize his claims of deity. You know, for him to say, uh, before Abraham was, I am. He, he knew exactly what he was saying. They knew exactly what he was saying. Because they, the Bible says they picked up stones to, to kill him because he made himself God. Um, uh, this was something that was, was very personal. And his suffering was for our sin. And by the way, uh, uh, verse 5 there, uh, when it says, with his stripes we are healed, is not about physical healing. It's about our sin. As you look at this, this passage, he's not saying that if you can have a healthy body, you, you'll be all right. Listen, you can have the world's most healthy body and die and go to hell. He's talking about spiritual healing. He's talking about healing from, from our sins. Uh, he was a man uh, of sorrows. He was a man of suffering. The Bible says in John 1.11, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. You know, what a, what a time it was as he came to uh, fulfill the scriptures, that tender plant that God had brought to that place, and uh, yet many would not, would not receive him. He was on the cross for about six hours, and uh, the first three, man did his worst. I, I don't think there's been a, a way of killing people devised that is more cruel than, than dying on a cross. They, they say you actually die from suffocation. Now you just get to where you, you fill with fluid and you can't breathe anymore. But not only did man do his worst, um, what does it say here? There he was, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God. Then on the cross, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As Jesus became sin for us. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians, he says, He, that's God, hath made him, that's Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin. He'd never sinned, but he became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That God drew a veil of darkness and treated Jesus as our sin. He's a man of sorrows, a man of, of suffering. Uh, we, we need to be careful that we understand uh, what Jesus went through. Salvation is maybe free, but it's certainly not cheap. Uh, it's, the, it's the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in verse 7, he's a, a man of, of silence. He opened not his mouth. Um, he, he didn't try and talk his way out of it. I always remember as a, as a boy hearing the song, he could have called 10,000 angels. I guess we still occasionally might, might sing that. Uh, he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have but he didn't. He just uh, took what he knew he had to take uh, for our soul's redemption. You know, we see his heritage, the, the prophecy and the virgin birth, and uh, we see his suffering. Uh, we see the, the violent death. And remember, this was written 700 years before Christ died. 
This was written before, I, I believe, before they even used the, the method of, of crucifixion. Uh, it, we know in verse 8, he talks about the, the mockery of a trial. Uh, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? Cut down in his prime. Jesus was about 33 years old. And the Bible talks here about uh, his grave with the wicked. In verse 9, he, he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Now, how would anybody know that except that God knows it? And he's crucified as a criminal and then buried in a rich man's tomb. I mean, how could you write that 700 years uh, b before it happens? Uh, crucified as a criminal. I came across something interesting. It, it, you probably know the Hebrew word for Jesus is Yeshua. You hear that once in a while. Yeshua. Well, the Jews through history have changed it, changed it to Yeshu when they refer to Jesus, our Jesus. And it's an acrostic. An acrostic is where you take each letter and you have a word with it. And it stands for, let his name be blotted out. That's what the Jews call Jesus, Yeshu. Let his name be blotted out. Uh, they also call him, and I'm probably not pronouncing this correctly, Tului in Hebrew, the hanged one. You know, Deuteronomy says, cursed is uh, anyone who's hanged on a tree. He, he became sin for us. He was wounded, he was despised, he was rejected, and then buried in a, a rich man's tomb. Uh, that's an amazing thing, uh, with the rich in his death. And the, the Bible says here at the end of verse 9, he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. He had an unblemished record. He didn't respond and, with any wickedness. He didn't contradict his own, his own teachings. He didn't die for his own sins. Uh, verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. I mean, that's an amazing statement, isn't it? How strange that Jesus would die so terribly, and yet the Bible would say it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And the reason is, now, this helps me a lot to realize there's only one God. All right? It's not like God the Father and God the Son are, are different gods. They're the same person. They're the same person, let me put it that way. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God. God was manifest in the flesh. When Jesus was on earth, God was still filling the universe. And we need to understand that God himself became a man and died for us. And it pleased him because it did what he wanted to be done. Jesus came and, and died for our sins. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 says, uh, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. You see, there was joy before him. It pleased the Lord to see, I can take care of this sin problem. I'll, I'll become sin myself so that these people that I love can have forgiveness. What a blessing. It pleased the Lord to, bru to bruise him. That's what it means when it says, by his stripes we are healed. It's talking about our sins being forgiven. It's why he came. Luke says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Paul wrote, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He added, of whom I'm, I'm chief. 1 Timothy chapter 1. That's why he came, and it pleased him to accomplish what he set out to do. Uh, we know he was born to die. As we read Isaiah 53, uh, we see Jesus. We see salvation. The end of uh, the middle there of verse 10, you might say uh, there's a prolonging of his days. Uh, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Because of his, well, let's just say, because of the gospel, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, we get life. There's a prolonging of his days. Uh, he uses the expression here, he shall see his seed. Um, somewhere in there, very, yeah, in the middle of verse 10. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. I mentioned to you John 1.11. Um, he, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. The next verse says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. By faith in Christ, uh, there's a prolonging of days, there's everlasting life. 
And verse 11, you have to say there's a, there's a satisfying conclusion. He uses that word. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Jesus was able to say it's finished. Uh, it's done. And it's done right. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Now, what a, what a blessing that through what Jesus has done, we have salvation. You know, for us, there's so many things that God has, has done in, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, we're justified, declared righteous, we're forgiven. Uh, we have a church. You know, that, that came because of what Jesus did. Uh, we have, uh, we'll have resurrection ourselves. You know, whatever they do to our body, uh, we don't have to worry about it. Burn it, drown it. <laughs> you know, let God worry about that. Uh, absent from the body, present with the Lord, and, and God will give us a, a new body, you know, whatever. Uh, what a blessing. Uh, and it's because of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, we see the virgin birth. We see his suffering. We see his death. Uh, we see a victorious uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the, the result here is in, in verse 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Uh, he has an exalted position. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier in Philippians, it says, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is exalted. And someday every, every person will recognize that. Uh, an exalted position. A completed task. Because uh, he hath poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many. Uh, he did what he set out to do. Uh, he's exalted because he is Jesus, because he is the Lord, and because he's done what he said he would do. Uh, one of the things that it talks about here is he identified with us. He was numbered with the transgressors. Christ became one of us. And he, and he finished the job. Hebrews puts it this way. Hebrews 10.10, 10, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Done. Later he says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. It's not only done in history. When you receive Christ as Savior, it's done in your life. Listen, there's nothing you can add to make yourself really saved. <laughs> you're either saved or you're not. And it's by faith in Jesus Christ, not by works of righteousness, which we've done. I think we were talking about this some in, in Sunday school this morning. Uh, you know, it's not by works. It's by grace. It's by God's mercy. God does the work of salvation. And he, he talks about it so clearly and so strongly here in Isaiah. And then it says, uh, not only is he exalted and his job is done, but he has another job right now, the end of verse 12, and made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus is praying for us. You know, what, a, what a blessing it is. First John puts it this way, we have an advocate with the Father. We have one who represents us. Now, th this wouldn't happen, but if, if God were to, were to say, Oh, these, these people have sinned. Jesus could say, no, I've borne their sins and show his nail-scarred hands. Now, th that wouldn't happen. But we have an advocate with the Father. We have one who's praying for us, one who represents us. And this, this morning, uh, we need to realize that Jesus is the complete Savior. You don't have to add something to Jesus to be saved. A baptism doesn't save you. You know, some people say speaking in tongues. You, uh, we had a person tell us if we didn't speak in tongues, we'd go to hell. Oh, you know, there's, there's lots of things people try to add. Uh, become a member of a church or whatever. No, it's only Jesus and Jesus only. Uh, he's, he's the one. He's the complete Savior. Now, I want to encourage you this morning. If you're saved, remember what it cost him. It's, it's a precious gift, the gift of salvation. Remember what it bought for you. Not only eternal life. You know, salvation is, is not just the difference between going to heaven and hell. It's a relationship with the God of the universe. It's things that will carry you through this life. Uh, we're going to talk about how tough life can be tonight. And it can be tough, but when you know the Lord, He said he'll, he'll go with you. He'll be your shepherd. He'll go with you through the valley of the shadow of death. Now remember what it cost Him. Remember what it bought you. And remember that He intercedes for you. You know Christ is your Savior. Uh, you know, the, the things that the Bible talks about are not just possible. They're promised. 
And he'll make sure that you have exactly what you need in your relationship with God for eternity. I'm going to encourage you, if you're a Christian this morning, uh, don't be downhearted. Uh, listen, be trusting the Lord. Have your hope in the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. But if you're not saved, you're not sure about your relationship to God this morning, you need to see yourself and you need to see God in verse 6 of this chapter. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Listen, if you want your way, God will let you have it. But he warns you it ends up in hell. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yours, mine, everyone. Jesus died for the sins of the world. You need to see yourself as the sinner and Jesus as the Savior. And this morning, you can. the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Listen, you can't get saved tomorrow. You've got to get saved today. Now, some of you have been saved on today and a day past. Praise the Lord for that. And he says it's eternal. He doesn't say it's temporary. He says it's eternal. There's, there's things that are temporary. Some of them we're pretty grateful for, you know. You ever had a toothache? I'm glad it's temporary. Uh, but there are some things that are eternal. And your relationship to God or your lack of one is going to be eternal. And you need to take care of it now. If you're not saved, uh, the Bible says, when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. We can't save ourselves. We don't have the strength. We don't have the ability. But at the right time, God had tendered that plant, and Jesus came exactly when God intended him to come. And he lived and died for us. He was buried. He rose again. He went back to heaven. And listen, you're in exactly the right time and place God wants you to be. God doesn't make mistakes. And God has allowed you to hear the gospel. God has allowed you to, to hear this morning, Isaiah 53. What a jewel in God's crown here. And someday you'll stand before God and you'll give an account of what you've heard. And listen, I, I don't want to be guilty of not sharing the gospel. I believe I have this morning. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I, I would plead with you. I mean, really, I would plead with you. Trust Christ today. Make Him your Savior. He promises that whosoever will come, He'll not turn you away. He says you can come and He'll receive you because Jesus has made it possible. For by one offering He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. What a blessing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Their heads bowed in, in an attitude of prayer. Maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart. Maybe you're not sure about your salvation or maybe as a Christian you've been ungrateful all that God has done for you. Father, we are humbled before you this morning to think that before you even made the world, you knew that you'd have to die for our sins. And Father, you knew that we would be here today. You knew that we would have ungodly thoughts and actions, and yet you loved us and made a way for us to be saved. Thank you for being our Savior. Father, I pray if there are any here this morning that are not saved, that are not sure of their relationship to you, that today they would make that sure. Lord, you said you've written your word so that we can know. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to sing a